It was a war that changed the world. It had no real objective. Europe had been looking forward to it for two generations. Hi kids, I'm Private John. Welcome to another extra credit documentary. Today we'll look at World War I. By the time the guns stopped firing, there were 59 declarations of war. 14 million Europeans went to the grave. So did 120,000 Americans. Four empires crumbled. The United States had fought in it, but had no interest in it, and got none of the spoils of war. Look up World War I in your history textbook, and you'll find out the story. Archduke Francis Ferdinand of Austria, Hungary, was shot by a Serbian nationalist. It was followed by Germany's four-year effort to conquer the world. Not at all. Germany and its ally, Austria-Hungary, were the ones who least wanted a war. Relations in Europe had been strained for the past 43 years. The European countries were always squabbling over something, usually about how to divide the brown countries amongst themselves. With the buildup in armaments and entangling alliances, just about everyone in Europe, including Otto von Bismarck, expected a general European war. Now let's go back to the 19th century and see what was going on. The Moroccan crisis was the latest in Europe's battle for the colonial empire. England wanted to know what right Germany had to sail around the world and conquer brown people. Well, I guess it's the same right England had in the 16th century. England had the biggest empire in the world. What were they afraid of? Britain had the largest fleet in the world and was afraid when Germany started to build up its own fleet. Again, Britain had the largest fleet in the world and could have crushed the Germans in a naval war. So what was the problem? Germany, a latecomer in the colonial game, needed a fleet to manage their empire. There were several attempts at rapprochement between England and Germany in the decade before the war. Rapprochement means they wanted to make up. The one in 1911 to 1912 came to a tragic ending. The British suggested they would respect Germany's territorial aims if Germany curbed the construction of its fleet. It turned into a deal of British neutrality. If Germany were forced into war, the German ambassador, Count Metternich, thought an agreement like this would offend the French. He was right. French Prime Minister Raymond Poincaré told Sir Edmund Grey, the British Foreign Minister, that if he signed such a treaty, he could forget about Anglo-French relations. Later, Poincaré would refuse an attempt at German-French rapprochement. Despite the crybaby French, Anglo-German relations were improved. In 1913, Winston Churchill, first Lord of the Admiralty, and Admiral von Trippitz agreed the Germans would build no more than 10 ships for every 16 by the British. And in 1914, the two countries came to an agreement on the Baghdad Railway, which would have brought a German presence to the edge of the British Empire. Though at the very same time, Lord George was cementing a naval agreement with France and Russia to tighten their grip around poor Germany. Now, Russia wanted the Straits of Turkey. Russian Foreign Minister Alexander Petrovich Islovsky persuaded his successor, Sergei Dmitrovich, Sasnov that obtains the Straits was possibly only through the war. In a memo to the Tsar on December 8, 1913, we see his conversion to the war plan. Can we permit any other country to obtain entire control of the passage through the Straits? I must repeat that the question of the Straits can hardly be advanced a step except through European complications. In the winter of 1913-14, secret meetings were held to decide if Russia should seize the Straits unaided or wait for the European war. They decided the latter was preferable, because it would be better for their image. They wanted England on their side in a European war. Then military plans against Turkey were drawn up. French ambassador to Russia, George Louis, wrote, In the alliance, Constantinople and the Straits formed the counterpart to Alsace-Lorraine. If the Russians open the question of the Straits with us, we must respond, yes, when you aid us with respect to Alsace-Lorraine. Alsace and Lorraine were two provinces the Germans took from the France during the Franco-Prussian War. So to sum up the situation, Germany simply wanted a place in the sun. Austria-Hungary wanted to maintain the status quo, which meant, they, which meant they liked things fine the way they were. England was content on conquering helpless brown people. Russia wanted the Straits, and France wanted Alsace-Lorraine. So the only goals that could be attained by war were those of France and Russia. Now let's learn a new word, propaganda. It means the spreading of an idea through print, radio, etc. This word is used mostly when the ruling class 
tries to warp the minds of the hoi polloi. In this case, newspapers had to be used to persuade peace-loving people to go to war. When trouble came out of the Balkans in 1912, Poincaré tried to keep the peace. The French public wouldn't go to war on the Balkans, so the French newspapers were bribed with Russian gold to print stories and editorials to convince them France had an interest in the Balkans. On November 11, 1912, M. Davidoff of the Russian National Debt Office telegraphed from Paris, Summary of my discussion with Poincaré and our ambassador. Both are of the opinion that payments to the press should be postponed, but consider it desirable to have ready 300,000 francs for the purpose of immediate intervention when embarked upon at a later date. The money came, and by December 18th, Islowski reported, To secure the attitude, I am at present doing my utmost to influence the press, and this certain substantial results have been attained. In the whole, there can be no comparison between the tone of the Paris press at present and during the 1908-1909 crisis. On June 28, 1914, Archduke Francis Ferdinand of Austria-Hungary visited Sarajevo to inspect the army station there. He and his wife were shot by a Serbian nationalist. Austria-Hungary was a dual monarchy. Austria was peopled by Germans, Hungary by Yugoslavs. The Serbs wanted to liberate their Slavic brothers. It would be like if Mexico wanted to liberate the Mexicans living in the U.S. The assassination was engineered and executed by the Black Hand, a nationalist group that included members in the Serbian government and military, and was assisted by Russian money. So the Austrians wrote an ultimatum. That means, do this or else. So they made their list of demands. The Kaiser had told Austria that this was a purely Austrian problem, so the Austrians must decide how to handle Serbia. This is the famous blank check. The ultimatum dealt with getting rid of all anti-Austrian propaganda in Serbia. The Austrians wanted the ultimatum to be so outrageous the Serbs wouldn't accept it. They wouldn't deny the chance to finally put Serbia in its place. As Austria was an ally, the Kaiser wanted to shift retribution. He didn't think war was the only possible solution to the problem, but he in no way felt a local punitive war would become a European war. Even as Russia was secretly mobilizing, the Kaiser commented, I could not assume that the Tsar would place himself on the side of bandits and regicides. So on July 6th, he informed his military officers there was no need for military preparations, and he went on vacation. Not knowing the ultimatum was designed to provoke Serbia, he wrote in the margin of the Serbian reply, A brilliant performance for a time limit of only 48 hours. A great moral victory for Vienna. He wrote to German Foreign Minister von Jigau, I am convinced on the whole, the wishes of the Danube monarchy have been acceded to. Every cause for war falls to the ground. But when Kaiser learned Austria and Russia were mobilizing, he burned his blank check and tried to restrain Austria. He suggested the Austrians occupy Belgrade until the term of the ultimatum were met. Austria would have to promise no land would be taken from Serbia. That would give Russia no reason to intervene. Sasnov had ordered a partial mobilization to the German border. But he needed permission from the peace-loving Tsar for a full mobilization. Sasnov was granted an audience with the Tsar. The Tsar gave his consent. This was July 29th. It proves Russia was the aggressor. Austria did not mobilize against Russia until July 31st, and Germany did not follow until August 1st. Moreover, the bulk of the mobilization was at the German line. Negotiations after the 25th were bogus. Russian General Dobrolovsky confessed that by July 25th, war was already decided upon. Serbian Premier Pashtic wrote to his chief of staff, The reports received from our minister at St. Petersburg state that Russia is now negotiating and is prolonging negotiations in order to gain time for mobilization and concentration of her army. The imponderable was England. The Germans knew England would enter the war if Germany did. Germany asked for British neutrality if it promised not to attack France. Gray wouldn't listen. On July 31st, Gray had told Paul Campbell, France's ambassador to England, would enter the war with Russia. Germany was torn between abandoning its ally and facing France, Russia, England, possibly Italy. The Kaiser made several appeals to the Tsar for peace. His final one came 2 p.m. on the 31st. The responsibility of the disaster, which is now threatening the whole civilized world, will not be laid at my door. In this moment, it still lies in your power to avert it. Nobody is threatening the honor of power of Russia. 
Now, to get to France, the Germans marched through Belgium, which was a neutral country. On August 4th, Britain declared war on Germany. Sir Edward Grey was honor-bound to come to France's aid. He played right into Poincaré's hands. But that is not to say England had its own motives, namely to sink the German fleet, steal its colonies, and its commerce. The official reason for entering the war was to punish Germany for violating Belgian neutrality. But that was just pretext. Pretext means simply an excuse. <laughs> France and England were by no means surprised. Franco-British plans in 1911, 1912, and 13 called for attacking Germany through Belgium. For the past 10 years, the British tried to get Belgian permission to let the British troops enter. The Belgian king had said he'd prefer a German occupation to a French occupation. The honorable Germans admitted the Belgian invasion violated its neutral rights, but the British would defend their violations of neutral rights on the high seas. We were for Prussia during the Franco-Prussian War. Former President Teddy Roosevelt stated he had gotten more help from the Kaiser in ending the Russo-Japanese War than from anyone else. The June 8, 1913 edition of the New York Times had a section devoted to Kaiser Wilhelm II, celebrating his first 25 years in power. In it, former President Taft is quoted as saying, the German emperor has been for the last quarter century the greatest single individual force in practical maintenance of peace in the world. Officially, we were friendly toward Germany right up until the end. <clears throat> so what went wrong? Well, as an emerging colonial power, Germany ticked off not only the British. American merchants competed with Germans for business in Latin America. The U.S. had disagreements with Germany over China and Venezuela, and in 1889 we almost went to war over Samoa. We got our war news from England, complete with fake stories of German atrocities. For example, pictures of German, quote, atrocities in Poland were shown. It was found out later that pictures were taken in 1905 in the same country where the Russians were slaughtering Jews. In 1925, British General J.V. Sauteris, during a speech in New York City, admitted to his own doctoring of photos. He had a picture of a dead German horse bound for a fertilizer plant. He put the tile on a picture of dead German soldiers on their way to be interred. Then the British sent the picture to China, land of ancestral worship. The Chinese were appalled at the Germans' supposed desecration of the dead. This helped influence the Chinese to enter the war on the side of the Entente. And then there was President Wilson and his cabinet. They were Anglophiles. That means they loved Britain and all things British. In the winter of 1915-16, a year before America joined the war, he sent his aide, Colonel House, to England with a plan for peace. The Germans were harsh against Germany, but the Germans were willing to negotiate. However, the British weren't interested. Later, House told Sir Robert Cecil and Edward Grey, the United States would like Great Britain to do whatever would help the United States to aid its allies. Wilson's next attempt came in April 1916 when he met Congressman H.D. Flood and Claude Kitchen to see if they'd help support him in a plan to bring America into the war. A congressman refused. The country was too divided. Wilson decided to wait after the election to send our boys off to die. By that time, the press would have conditioned the public for war. So the slogan for his re-election campaign was, He kept us out of war. At the Democratic National Convention, Senator Ali James was a keynote speaker, and a fantastic speech he gave. Four years ago, they called Wilson a school teacher. Today, he is the world teacher. His lesson is, the saving of neutral life, the freedom of the seas, and without widowing a single American mother, without firing a single gun, without shedding a single drop of blood. A month after his second inauguration, he asked for a declaration of war. In Wilson's April 2nd speech, he gave Germany's submarine warfare as the reason for his request. But let's find out why Germany took this course. When the war began, the British set up a blockade around Germany. First, Sea Lord Winston Churchill declared, We'll starve them into submission, men, women, children, old and young, wounded and sound into submission. Thus, neutral ships were not allowed in to bring food to civilians. Germany retaliated by sinking British merchant ships. The U-boat captains were ordered not to attack U.S. ships. The British blockade was illegal. German civilians needed to import food to survive. International law allowed ships safe passage for this purpose. We aggravated the Germans by holding them to strict adherence to international law, but ignored Britain's flagrant violations. 
the blockade wasn't the only illegal British action. They seized American ships, intercepted our mail, used our flag on their ships, and detained U.S. officials traveling to and from Europe. These were basically the causes of the War of 1812. The danger to Americans came when they sailed on British vessels. The most infamous case was that of the Lusitania. On May 7, 1915, the ocean liner set sail from New York to Britain. It was torpedoed by Germans, killing 1,198 people, 128 of whom were Americans. Enraged Americans like Teddy Roosevelt wanted to join the war right away. Ignored was the fact it was a British registered ship, and in its holds were six million pounds of ammunition and explosives. Therefore, it was not protected by the rights of unarmed vessels. The 128 Americans were also in violation of U.S. law. Passengers were not allowed to travel on trains or ships carrying explosives. William Jennings Bryan pointed these things out to Wilson four days before the Lusitania set sail and begged him to forbid the passengers from sailing. The Germans protested that the United States was holding them accountable to international law and ignoring Britain's flagrant violations. They reminded Wilson that they had put ads in U.S. newspapers urging Americans not to sail on the ship. Bryan asked, Why be shocked at the drowning of a few people if there is no objection to starving a nation? The only way to cut off the supply of American munitions to England was to resume unrestricted submarine warfare. The questions were clear. Should they risk sinking U.S. ships? Can they wear Britain down before the U.S. can send troops across the Atlantic? The Kaiser signed the order on the advice of his men. Then he said, Finis Germani. Submarine warfare brings to us another reason for the U.S. entry. The illegal British blockade around Germany made it impossible to sell arms to the Germans. So big business went with England. Banks invested in the war bonds of the Allies. Their emotional attachment was not to any country, but to money. If we were able to trade with the Central Powers, the U.S. would have been pro-German. Ambassadors William Graves, Robert Bacon, and former Ambassador Myron Herrick, all with connections to international banks, assured France the U.S. would enter the war on their side. But at the moment, there was no anti-German sentiment. Banker Bernard Baruch made $200 million off the war. Ditto J.D. Rockefeller. Thomas Lamont of the firm J.P. Morgan & Company admitted, Our firm had never for one moment been neutral. From the very start, we did everything we could to contribute to the cause of the Allies. By 1917, the Allies' credit was so bad that the Wall Street bankers had decided the only thing they could do was transfer the burden from their wallets to those of the U.S. taxpayers. But as the U.S. was neutral, they couldn't lend to combatants. By the time we entered the war, U.S. banks had lent $2.3 billion. Years later, Senator George Norris blamed the U.S. fatalities on the bankers. Concealed in their palatial offices on Wall Street, sitting behind mahogany desks, covered up with clipped coupons, coupons tainted with mother's tears, coupons dyed in the lifeblood of their fellow men. Now, we mentioned before the phony stories of German atrocities. In the Providence Journal, the propaganda got so bad, the government had to intervene. As a result of this propaganda, it got ridiculous. Dash rooms were stoned, sauerkraut was renamed Liberty Cabbage. Americans grew their own vegetables in the yards to leave more for the military. Schools stopped teaching German, Libraries burned German books, and the hamburger was renamed the Salisbury Steak. Then in February 1917, the British released a letter intercepted from the Germans. It was the infamous telegram from Arthur Zimmerman, the German foreign minister, to his agent in Mexico. One must keep in mind that the proposal was to be implemented only if the U.S. joined the war on the side of the Entente, which was the last thing the Germans wanted. The first paragraph gives us the gist of it. We intend to begin on the 1st of February unrestricted submarine warfare. We shall endeavor, in spite of this, to keep the United States of America neutral. In the event of this not succeeding, we make Mexico a proposal of alliance on the following basis. Make war together, make peace together, generous financial support, and an understanding of our part that Mexico is to reconquer the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. The settlement in detail is left to you, the lost territory in Texas, New Mexico, and Arizona. It refers to the part of the land we stole from Mexico in 1848. On April 2, 1917, President Wilson asked Congress to declare war. Four days later, it was granted. At the time, 
Americans didn't know the British captured the telegram three months earlier and waited to reveal it after the press conditioned the public for war. So, like Belgian neutrality, the submarine warfare was the pretext for war. American industry lost $180 million to submarine warfare. The war cost us $30 billion. Finally, Wilson confessed he wanted to foist his 14 points on the world. And as the head of a nation participating in the war, he'd have a seat at the peace table and could dictate what would happen after the war. If the states remained neutral, the best he could do was call through a crack in the door. What Wilson wanted was world government. What he proposed was a League of Nations. The United States did not take kindly to the treaty or to the League. Senator Henry Cabot Lodge called it an evil thing with a holy name. William E. Borah stated he would not vote for it, even if Jesus Christ himself came to earth and pleaded for the covenant. Robert La Follette called it a super legislature to let the world exploit America's bountiful resources. But Wilson believed the League was divinely inspired and that he was an agent of God. Opponents to the treaty offered amendments to help preserve our sovereignty. Wilson said they ruined the spirit of his League, so he urged his own party to vote against it. These senators weren't isolationists. They wanted the U.S. to be a leader, but it was another story to surrender America's sovereignty to an outside organization. Wilson was proposing sending Americans off to die for other people's causes. While the world organization to promote peace is a nice thought, how much peace can come out of a group made of a bunch of corrupt, warlike, selfish states? It's like asking a safe cracker, a carjacker, or a bank robber, and a registered a sex offender to form a neighborhood watch. The war was sold to us on the basis that we had to keep German tyrants from conquering the world and make the world safe for democracy. The absolute reverse is true. First, it must be realized we prolonged the war. The Germans couldn't defeat the Allies on two fronts. In December 1916, they sent a proposal to the Allies to end the war on reasonable terms. Certainly much better than the horrific terms of the Versailles Treaty. The Allies kept the knowledge from us so America would join the war on their side savagely destroyed Germany, and imposed the childish revenge on Versailles. By prolonging the war, unnecessary more millions of Europeans were maimed and slaughtered, as well as 120,000 of our boys. The Russian hoi polloi wanted to get out of the war, and because we continued it, they overturned the Tsar's government and became communist. Immediately after the war, France and England claimed it was solely they who won the war. Forming new countries guaranteed future squabbles, the vicious terms of the Versailles Treaty only stirred up the Germans' hatred, making the place ripe for Hitler. We didn't make the world safe for democracy. Rather, we made it safe for communism, fascism, and Nazism.